start new You're already chasing With relentless pursuit You have my attention You have my whole life I don't want to miss you here So open my got something to hide uh, i don't know how to respond in worship should i just like be chill i'm not sure i wish he would just go all out and worship yeah i'm just gonna chill i don't know what her tradition is okay i'm gonna let him lead i'm not gonna raise my hands unless he does oh yes oh i love this song wait are his eyes open is he looking at the screens who doesn't know the words to oceans Oh no, is he crossing his arms? Maybe he's not into it. I wonder if he's upset about something. Oh, it's time for the tithes and offerings. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tithe, I'm a guest. I don't know, maybe I'll just put in 20 bucks. 20 bucks? How cheap is he? Wait, 10% of 20 bucks is like, does he make $200 a week? Oh, this isn't gonna work out. Oh, baby dedication, really? Oh, I love babies. We're gonna have five. Man, I'm really into this sermon. Oh, she moved forward. Maybe I should put my arm on the back of the chair. Wait, I think he just put his arm on my chair. If I've moved back, it's like his arm is around me. Oh, I love this. I feel so safe. 
I can tell this is really hitting home with him. He's really responding to this. I wonder what the score of the game is. Oh, he's got his eyes closed. The Holy Spirit must be really working in his life. I shouldn't have eaten that burrito for breakfast. I love having a new boyfriend. I hope people don't think we're dating. Oh, he's taking notes. Do not give yourselves over to lust. Oh, great. I wonder if he has a problem. Oh, my phone's vibrating. Let me just check it like real quick. Oh, he's getting his phone out. I bet he's looking up scripture on the Bible app. ESPN? Really? This is really hitting home with me. What, is she crying right now? Oh man, I, where's it? I gotta find some Kleenex. Thank you. I, you know what, I'll just wait in the lobby. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Westview Community Church. As I look out there and see a few new faces um, to our guests. We are really glad you're with us today as you search for a church home or you're just visiting. We're glad you're with us. Actually, we always like to say, from the minute you walk to the door, we hope you feel like family. And that is what our series is about. We're right in the middle of a, of a sermon series called All Star Family. And uh, it's a series about healthy relationships in marriage, within our families, and within our church family as God designs, as he's written in the Bible. And so we're using a baseball theme because it's a really cool idea during the playoffs, unless you are an Indians fan or a Brewers fan now and know where you're unhappy, but we'll just move on from that because this is supposed to be uplifting. For some of us, we're still hurting. So we're using this baseball theme, and so our first sermon we stepped out and talked about, we got to step up to the plate. Being Christian in the world today is a heart. It's countercultural. And so as a family, we have to step up to the plate first. And then the second sermon we did last week was about, we talked about going around the bases. We talked about a single. And so we dealt with singleness from a biblical standpoint. And, and so in case you weren't here and you're single today and you weren't here last week, I'm really going to encourage you to go back to our website and listen to that sermon online because singleness in our culture is largely looked down upon and we just prove that through the Bible. Singleness actually is a gift. It's not a disease. You're not defective. And all of us will be single once. Many of us will be single twice, whether we lose a spouse, whether divorce. So singleness has a big impact, but we showed God's design as a gift for us in our singleness. And so, um, and we also issued a challenge. Actually, there's a church-wide challenge going on right now called, what's for dinner? Thank you. Thank you. I better put that in my notes for next time. For what's for dinner. What's for dinner is a thing for all of our families. We started this the very first week. And what's for dinner is a way of reclaiming the dinner table, putting away our electronic devices and reclaiming the dinner table and coming together as a family. But we extended that challenge to our singles. Last week we said, hey, for our singles, whether divorced, old, young, or, or widowed, is that we, as a church, we have to embrace, as a community of faith, we are family to singles. And so we issued a challenge last week, and we asked you that, hey, if you're single and you want to be connected to a dinner challenge, to a host family, we asked you to take this connect card and write just your contact information, your name, and write DC, dinner challenge. I would love to be invited to somebody's house and be part of the church community. Or we asked you to write your name and information and write host, like we would love to host a single in our church and bring us together in community. And last week, we got a stack of cards like that. So we have host families and we have singles. Yes, I would love the church family to come around me. If you missed last week, you can still write that today. You can write DC Dinner Challenge. I would love somebody to invite me. I'd love to get to know some people in church family while God works through me this gift of singleness. Or if you still want to host, write that on there, tear it off, throw it in the offering plate. We would love to connect you. Um, I'm already excited about the momentum that has. So, so in All Star Family, we've stepped up to the plate. We talked about a single, so we're going to move to second base, and we're going to talk about a double. We're going to talk about dating and marriage when two come together. And so I think it's an interesting point to start off by saying that marriage... The joining of two was not invented by humans. <laughs> Does everybody catch that? <laughs> Marriage is God's design. He's the one who first introduced it, and it's in his plan. And so we're going to look at marriage and dating from a biblical standpoint. And today's culture is really kind of interesting because the Christian concept of dating and marriage is considered old-fashioned, restrictive, a lot of do's and don'ts, 
And instead of sitting here and saying, hey, do all these things and don't do all these things, I'm actually going to represent in the Bible as marriage as a picture that is beautiful, stunning, jaw-dropping. And so when you come to the door today, like, like um, we just shared with you a little bit ago, we got these sermon notes on the back of your worship guide. If for our guests today, that's just a way of following along with us. So here's the first sermon note. God's design of marriage is a portrait of heaven. It's like, oh, that's a nice artistic phrase or word. Wow. It's like, no, seriously. God's design of marriage is beautiful. It's stunning. It's jaw-dropping. And it's a portrait of heaven. And we're going to explain this. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, the very first book in your Bible, chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 18, I believe. Yes. And so we're going to look at God's design right from the very first book of the Bible, second chapter, starting in verse 18. And we'll have it up here overhead too, just so you can read along and see the version that I'm reading out here, which is a New Living Translation. And the scripture reads, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But there still was no helper, just right for him. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. So we look at this together. Let's go back to this just a little bit in your Bible. The first thing that God did is he said, it's not good. You know, everything in the, seven, in the six days of creation, God said it was good, 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 and he realized something wasn't good. It wasn't good for man to be alone. And so he says, I will make a helper. And you're like, Adam's like going, awesome. Somebody to take out the trash and pick up my socks. That's not what the word helper means here. The helper, when you look at the word helper and the way it breaks down, is it says one who completes the other, the one who brings out the full potential of the other. And then all of a sudden we start naming animals. Well, how does this fit in here? <laughs> and I think this is really interesting. And some people think the scripture just doesn't fit, but it does. I think Adam, I mean, Adam learned two things. One, he saw the relationship of every male and female animal that was created and how they work together. And God also taught him patience in that effort. And he named every animal. But none of that was suitable. And Adam still had a desire. So God puts him into a deep sleep. It says it takes a rib. And I know these jokes about cheaper cut or whatever. But actually the word means from his side. God took something from his side. See, Adam was perfect and complete. And God took something from something that was perfect and complete to create something that was perfect and complete. And then God introduces him to the woman. And what does he scream? He exclaims, at last! <laughs> Anytime you name thousands of animals, you're going to be excited about seeing a woman. <laughs> Today's word is hubba hubba. You know, it's like, Wow! He's like, his jaw hits the ground. Look at what God designed. Look at what God created to complete him and for him to complete her. And the two became one. And it names her wife. Here's the first marriage. Not only are they one physically, they are one spiritually. 
in God's design. And they were buck naked. And there was no shame. God created marriage to be between a man and a woman. A beautiful design. Two different genders that complement each other. Designed to meet the emotional, spiritual, and physical needs. Their bodies were designed to create new life through the miracle of God. Their bodies were designed to fit together in a beautiful expression of sexualness. And they're designed to help each other reach their potential in becoming closer to each other and closer to God. That's all in the design. But there's another place that takes God's design of marriage was even more. And so we got to jump to Ephesians 5 and look at this short scripture which shows the completion of what God's purpose in marriage. So I want you to turn to Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, way towards the back of your Bible, into chapter 5. If you get a chance to read chapter 2 of Genesis and chapter 5 of Ephesians this week, it's a great way to go back and look at the design. So chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, and we're going to start in verse 31. And it's up here overhead too. This is a letter to the early Christian church in Ephesus. And it says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So it starts off, thousands of years later, Scripture again points back to Genesis 2. Starts with that. This is God's design. He made them, designed to get them together as one. And he says, this is a mystery. And sometimes spouses think their other spouse is a mystery, but this mystery is spiritual. He says it's a mystery. And it's not a mystery we can't understand, but it is so much bigger than us in what's going to happen with this marriage that we, it's jaw-dropping. And he gives us a hint with the word but. Our marriage is to look like the marriage that is coming, and that is the bride of Christ the bride is his church. We talked about this last week. And Christ is coming back for his bride. For an eternal marriage. And so we're seeing here that our marriage not only is our relationship with each other and God, but one day it will be fully complete and perfect again, just like it was in Genesis. So what happened between Genesis and Ephesians? One word, Jesus, happened. You see, in the garden, Adam and Eve were one. They were perfect, they were holy, they were very close to God. God says, walked with them in the garden. And then sin messed everything up. And they had to be cast out of God's presence, out of the garden. And not only did sin mess up the relationship with God, it messed up the relationship between man and woman. Now marriage was difficult and challenging. But then Jesus came. And he paid the price for that sin. That that separation from God need no longer be there. And for all who believe in him, we have access to God. And God is back in union with us, just like it was in the garden. And that marriage now, and our marriage today, and the union back with God is so good that God, actually his presence can be in us. God's spirit can dwell in us again. All because of what Jesus did on the cross. Our marriage grows us in holiness. One day, that union, as we see here in Ephesians 5, will be perfected in heaven. Jesus is coming for his bride. So let's put these two together. Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5. And this is so important to see these two together, to see the design that God has for marriage. Because our culture today tells us something entirely different. Our culture today, if you watch movies, if you watch any advertisement, it says marriage is about how you feel. Marriage is about your needs being met. It's all about you. 
Binge Netflix for a while and tell me that Hollywood does not paint a picture of marriage about, is about our happiness, especially your individual happiness. Or every advertisement we see about a car or this food, everything it does to make us better, it's all about us. The world paints a picture that marriage is about you, about the individual. But I want to put this statement, if I could put one statement up there that, that summarizes Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5, it's this statement here. It says, God designed marriage to meet our need for companionship and to provide a beautiful portrait of our relationship with him. That's the design of marriage. Marriage is about companionship. God said it wasn't good that man be alone. It's a union between two people, but more than that, it's a union of a third, and that's with God, our relationship with God. Our marriage is a way of growing in holiness and improving our relationship with God now. Our marriage is a glimpse of the marriage that is coming when Jesus returns to fully establish our union with God again, perfect like it was way back in the garden. And our marriage also is a glimpse to others who don't know God and don't know Jesus, that they're drawn to God. So the beauty of our marriage. That's why marriage is a portrait of heaven now. So how do these two scriptures apply to today in 2018? Well, Let's start where marriage starts with first. Let's talk about dating. You watch that video when we started about dating, right? <laughs> Have you ever had a dating experience like that? <laughs> Kara and I, when we met, she's not here in first service, so good. I can cover this one. <laughs> when I first saw Kara, it was kind of like Adam. At last! It's like, man, she looked Italian, she has that olive complexion, and she looked athletic. And she was neither. <laughs> Thank God he knew what I needed in life, not what I wanted. I googled dating. Seriously, I googled dating, because that's where all pastors start their sermons. 767 million hits. 767 million hits. And then I got this software on my computer, it's called Logos, right? It is access to everything about every commentary, every scripture. Uh, it's like when I power it up, the, the, the lights go down in a church, this thing's so powerful. And I plugged in dating. You know how many hits I got? Zero. You will not find the word dating anywhere in the Bible. So, Brian, how can we talk about biblical dating? Well, we do that under the lens of Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5. Do you know the concept of dating didn't even exist in biblical times? As a matter of fact, the idea of dating in the Middle East today is still a fairly new phenomenon. In the biblical times, the process of meeting a spouse had very little to do with compatibility and, and personality traits. It had everything to do with family lineage and economic status. Finding a mate functioned a lot more like a bartering system than it did a dinner and a movie. So dating is a relatively new, in the terms of centuries, concept. So how do we define it as biblical? Well, in your second sermon note, let's talk about dating. And this will explain it as we look at through the lens of Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5. So dating. Dating, we'll start off with this. Dating should only have a purpose of marriage. Dating should only have a purpose. Now help me clarify this. A date should not have the purpose of marriage, right? You don't, especially blind dates, that's really dumb. A date, you discover who this person is, right? But then when you choose dating, you are on a trajectory and dating should only, for a Christian, should only have the purpose of marriage. You're moving towards something that God designed that is beautiful and it's stunning and it changes who you are now today and it changes who you are for eternity. You want to get this right. And when it comes to dating, you want to pick the right season. We talked about this in singleness last week. Singleness is a great gift and opportunity to become much closer to God because you don't have the distractions. Take advantage of your singleness now to make sure you're on strong ground with your faith and your closeness to God because that'll do tremendous things to your dating relationship. So pick the right season to consider marriage. Second, dating someone who isn't a follower of Jesus is a bad idea. And this one kind of stuns, 
And this one kind of hits. So let me talk about this. Why? Why do we say that dating someone who's not a follower of Jesus is a bad idea? God's design of, be- of marriage is beautiful. It's a marriage is designed to bring you closer to him and closer to your spouse and prepare you for eternity. And the person you are dating will complete you as a helper in becoming what God wants you to be. If that's true, what the Bible says, and dating someone who doesn't believe in God or his son is a bad idea. It's moving completely against God's design for you for eternity. Missional dating. We talk about missional dating. You know, I, I, I'm dating this, this guy who's not a believer, and I, mean, I just know that God's going to, I'll get him to believe before we're married. You don't get anybody to believe. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. God works through you. Let me caution you about missional dating. And, and let, me, let me just back up on this. Is that there's, is, I'm not, I know there's people in the room that might be in a relationship right now. It's with a non-believer or somebody that might say they're Christian, but it's nominal at best. They don't really have a relationship with Christ. And I know you're reading this like, I need to go home and tell them it's over. And your heart invested. Before I say that, let me tell you this. If you're in a relationship right now with somebody who's not a believer or a nominal believer, like they really don't live like they're a Christ follower, meet with somebody here in church who can give you biblical counsel. Walk with you. And for goodness sake, be patient. Do not get married. Hold up any type of, of, uh, of announcement. Hold up any type of engagement. Because in God's beautiful design, this is perfecting you for eternity. You don't want to step into that in a wrong, in a wrong, completely moving against what God's design is. But before you go home and just say it's over, sit down and talk with somebody here. Give us a ring. Let's walk through you. I will tell you, my wife missionally dated me. Now, I wasn't a follower. And you're going, well, hey, Brian, you turned out to be a pastor. That's pretty sweet. There was a lot of pain and suffering that came from that. I'm glad God worked through that in such a big way. But please don't risk your eternity on that. Third, dating respects and waits on the gift of sexual expression. God brings many gifts to those who are married to include the gift of sexual expression. Have you ever heard like, you know, you aren't supposed to go swimming for 30 minutes after you eat? But how many of us went swimming at 15 minutes and we didn't drown? Right? And I think some people think about that, about a Christian restriction about sexuality before marriage. It's like, you know, I went and tried it and it was, I didn't drown. I want to give you a quote. This is from Jefferson Bethke. He's, a, he's an evangelist. Here's a quote that I really think fits. Dating without the intent of getting married is like going to the grocery store with no money. You either leave unsatisfied or you take something that isn't yours. Sexuality expression is only in a form of marriage. And let me explain why. This is where people get, well, the Christians do's and don'ts and so old-fashioned and stiff. Let me explain this a little bit. I think we wait because sex is not animalistic. It's not to satisfy an urge. It's sacred. It's a sacred gift. God designed sex for spiritual oneness and procreation. When he says two come become one, they are sewn together physically and spiritually. And that waiting builds trust and it honors your future spouse. We do this because God tells us. He understands the plan he has for us. And I saw this, this, this comparison. I thought this might hit home a little bit. It's like sex is like a Lamborghini. The car. $250,000 car. The $250,000 Lamborghini is created for the racetrack. It would not be smart to buy a $250,000 Lamborghini that's designed for the racetrack and drive it down a Kansas rural road. You'll destroy the car. That very expensive car would break, it would wreck, it would be destroyed. It's not made for Kansas rural roads. It's the same with sex. It's made for the roadway of marriage. And any time it's taken off that road and used in a different way, then people's hearts break, emotions are wrecked, and our lives and testimonies can be destroyed. Let me explain. When God brings two into one, he sows them spiritually and sows them physically. If we enter into a sexual encounter before marriage, we are sowing ourselves together spiritually. And the reason we wait is because so many people get that. They get something that's not theirs yet, and the minute they have that, the commitment fails. 
and they separate, and it's a tearing of that fabric. And every time you have sex with another partner outside of marriage, it continues to tear that fabric. So, so the scar tissue is so bad in you, you don't even know what a good sexual, intimate, spiritual event is anymore because you're so numb. It's a perfect design of spiritual oneness. And it needs to wait. Guys don't ask for sex and dating. Women don't give in and vice versa. So those three points. Dating. It should only have the purpose of marriage. It should only be with a follower of Jesus. And it should wait on that gift of sexual expression. So let's talk about marriage now, all right? That's the pathway to marriage. Let's talk about marriage. Watch this video first. Men, how many times has this happened to you? Me. You know, we, our babies sleep really, really good. Or this. Make sure Timmy wears the blue shirt. If he doesn't. Or even this. And for my birthday, which is next month, I'd really like some of this. Do you have trouble listening or retaining information from your wife? You could be suffering from spousal selective listening or SSL. With SSL, valuable input is intercepted or scrambled before it reaches the critical learning center of the man brain. Virtually anything can trigger it, like sports, food, even shiny objects with buttons. Fortunately, there is help with Heratol. Containing a rare root with an exotic name, Heratol helps men focus and listen to valuable female input, even pick up on those subtle hints. These are exactly the earrings I wanted. How did you know? Thanks, Heratol. Now I can hear it all. Heratol has not been tested or approved by any regulatory agency. Side effects with Heratol include minor to severe headaches and spontaneous combustion. Use caution when using Heratol near mothers in law, as you may hear hurtful comments that would have previously been ignored. Heratol is an enhancement drug. Do not use around children or clusters of talkative old blue haired women. If focus listening lasts longer than four hours, consult your doctor immediately before your wife assumes this is a new standard in your relationship. Men with wives who are nursing or pregnant should not take this product. Heratol, the preferred selection or solution for selective hearing. Let's talk about marriage. Look at your sermon on number three. <laughs> sermon on number three, marriage is, number one, it's a union of three, not two. Marriage is a union of three. Biblical marriage is not just a union of two people, it's a union of three persons. God's design of marriage shows that he's in relationship with us from the day we're married. His spirit is in us. For believers, his spirit dwells in us. Our small group met this week and we're watching, we're doing You and Me Forever, Francis Chan Marriage. And our small group heard this statement this week. It says, when you're mad at your spouse, remind them that in them is the Spirit of God. You're yelling at the Spirit of God who's in them. Not only is a union, the design of marriage, a union of three. And we speak to that in the way we do our wedding ceremonies. It's a union of three. That union is actually perfected in heaven. Second, marriage is about holiness before happiness. God designs marriage uh, to be how we are one in spirit with him and that design moves us to be more holy like him. The spouse he gives you and all her strengths help the guy in his weaknesses. The guy's strengths help her and her weaknesses. They come together and those strengths are combined and sewn together and they glorify God together. They grow each other together. They strengthen each other together. And that makes us more holy. And that holiness is so much more important than happiness. Our holiness makes our marriage better. You want joyful marriage? Have a holy marriage first and that will come. If you shoot for a marriage that's just about happiness, without holiness, you will struggle. And the third, and well, let me go on, let me hit on this point. I think it's a good point that's out of the book we're studying. It says marriage problems usually are not people problems. They're God problems. And when I look at all the marital counseling that we do, I can tell you that most of it is God problems in the marriage before it's people problems. Third, marriage is about keeping a covenant. A covenant is an agreement. Most of us understand it, but it's so much different than a contract. A contract is between two people. A contract says if I fail my part, then I owe this, or you fail your part, you owe this. There's an out in there. But marriage is not a contract. Marriage is a covenant. A covenant involves three people. God, you, and your spouse. 
And it is not breakable. You don't get the final decision on the covenant. God enters into this. And that covenant is three ways. In that covenant, if I can show you an image of a triangle, God's at the top and you and your spouse are down here. The closer you get in that triangle to God, the closer you draw in your spouse in that same direction. The closer you both get to God, the stronger your marriage is. But just the opposite can happen. The more you pull away from God, by converse, you pull away from your spouse. It's so important in this covenant. It is of a third. That's why we say in a marriage that nobody can put asunder, nobody can take and separate what God has brought together. There are times in marriage when there's so much strife and pain and suffering and even abuse that that covenant is at risk. And I say, if you're ever there, come and get counsel and get help and get to a safe place. We've seen God restore marriages that are amazing, amazingly broken. But it is a covenant. So we can see overall at dating and marriage, it is a portrait of heaven. And so let me wrap up with this quote. This is from an author. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus and the plans he has for your life. Look ahead and run after him with all your heart. And then look around. Whoever's kept up with you, marry that person. Let's write that for people who are married. Fix your eyes on Jesus and the plans he has for your life. Look ahead and run after him with all your heart and look around and make sure your spouse is right alongside you. For when we're holy, our marriage is amazing. And it's only a glimpse of what it's going to look like in heaven. Amen? Amen. Ushers, would you come forward please for the offering? Offering continues our worship together. We're going to bow our heads together in prayer. And we're going to, we're going to always, we always do two things here. We pray about change in our lives. And we pray about how we can give and how we can, how we can serve and how we can love. Um, would you please rise? Stand with me. So I want to leave you just with um, a, a last verse of this portrait of heaven. And it comes right out of the book of Revelation. It's the last book of the Bible. And it's the only book of the Bible that hasn't happened yet. The Bible is still alive, amen? It's a, li a living document of God's word. And so this is there. I'm not going to put it up overhead. I just want you to listen to this, okay? This is from Revelation 19, 6 through 9. This is what our marriages are going to look like. It says, Then I heard again what sounded like a shout of vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words that come from God. So may your dating and your marriage be a beautiful portrait of heaven. Have a great week.